Jordan Kratz's documentary, based on his family from the late 1920s to 1949, is the culmination of three years of work. The film focuses on the lives of Jews residing in the southeastern Carpathian Mountains in the towns of Lou, Belki Bushkal, Rachel, Hust, and Seget before, during, and after the Holocaust. Information is presented through interviews with family and friends who lived during World War II. The following is a list of those who have shared their childhood recollections. The immediate Kratz family includes Michael Kratz, the father of Jordan Kratz, Barry Kratz and wife Sarenka, the three sisters, Dory Kratz and husband Zoli Sklar, Julia Kratz and husband Rudy Wolf, and Esti Kratz, cousin Yetsu and husband Andor Kepitz, and cousin Ansi Rosenheck. The Schraders from Saget represent the Kratz family's maternal side. Manolo Schrader, brother to Rivka Schrader, who was the mother of Michael, Barry, Dory, Julia, and Esti Kratz. Lunchu Schrader and husband Meyer Mueller. Lunchu is Bertha Schrader's daughter. Bertha Schrader was Rivka's sister. Max and Rivka Feig were the Kratz family's next door neighbors in Lou. This is the first documentary which specifically deals with Jewish people living in the region. Now let us journey backwards and learn of the tribulations Jewish people faced in those times. In the latter years of the 17th century, the Austrian Habsburgs defeated the Ottoman Turks, reuniting Hungary under their rule. The new ruler encouraged emigration to rebuild the war-torn lands, so these years saw the arrival of many Jewish families who would settle throughout the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Following the end of World War I, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was dissolved and the Czechoslovakian Republic was created. Carpathia was formed from part of eastern Slovakia along with the four most northeastern counties of Ung, Berig, Uguska, and Marmaros. Marmaros was cut in half for now its border would be the River Tisa. On the southern banks lay northern Transylvania in Romania. On the northern banks, the Czechoslovakian province of Carpathia. Escaping from the pogroms of Russian lands, they came in search of peace, many settling in the region of the Carpathian Mountains. Jews became traders and also worked in the various essential skills necessary to the village, such as blacksmiths, cobblers, tailors, butchers, and in all other forms of employment. A great lumber industry was built up, and in the most remote spots, one could find Jewish lumbermen and raftsmen who guided the wood to the larger cities by riverways. The countryside is one of hills, mountains, forests, farms, and rivers. There are many small villages, 
where most buildings are made of wood and the mainstay of the region is built on agriculture. Primitive by our standards today, these people lived a simple life, but for what material goods they did not have, they made it up by their profound belief in God. Almost every Jew was orthodox in practice. Most Jewish families dwelt along the main street close to their businesses in the small village. Nearly every family owned a small garden and many families also owned some domestic animals like cows, horses, goats, and chicken. Geese was a favorite for everyone. The geese fat could be spread on bread. From the wealthiest to the poorest, all Jews contributed to the support of the community. The rabbis, teachers, and scholars were supported by their community. Usually, the first building in the Jewish community to be erected was that which housed the ritual pool called a mikvah. Jewish men and women would go here, but never together, to ritually purify oneself in order to go to services at the synagogue or shul, as the house of prayer is called. A man was appointed to keep the water in the mikvah clean as well as the shul and the grounds around it. The Jewish children all went to two separate schools, the public school and the Jewish school called a cheder. The cheder was a school where the children learned the Hebrew alphabet, Jewish life, and the Bible and reading. These cheders could be located in a teacher's house, its own building, or a room in the shul, depending on the wealth of the community. As the child grew older, he was initiated into the more complex ways of Jewish ritual. The holidays were all observed, with some being quite festive and interesting. There were certain holidays where all the Jews would sing and dance, carrying the Torah in their arms through the village streets almost all night long. Each week, the Sabbath came and so on Friday, all the men would go to the mikveh while the women set out clean silverware and tablecloths while preparing the festive Sabbath meal. The Orthodox would prepare enough food for Saturday because Jewish law forbid the preparing of food before sunset on Saturday. On Friday night, all the families stayed together and after their meal, the elders would tell the young many wondrous stories. There was also family singing and dancing. Family life was very close in these days. Of course, there was little or no cars and no running water. The toilets were old-fashioned outhouses. Nearly every home had no electricity, and so people lived in harmony with the land around them. When there was a Jewish wedding, the whole village turned out for these were festive times. There was loud music, singing, dancing, and drinking and eating. Sometimes a wedding could go on for days. By the 1930s, there were Hebrew gymnasiums, youth groups, summer camps, and the young grew up dreaming of the modern world. Well, Lou was situated between Verkibochkov and Rakhov. It was a small little town and there were about 30 Jewish families. Now, I don't know if it was 150 or 200 people, because most of the families, which were uh, uh, most couples, you know, used to have six, seven, eight uh, children. So it probably, uh, I, I would say between 150 and 200 Jewish people. And the town, was mostly Ukraine people. Now, I don't know how they got to Lou uh, after the World War I, or they were there before, but uh, most Gentiles were Ukraine. There were some Hungarian families which were left over from the Austro-Hungary uh, Empire and they stayed after World War I. 
uh, mostly Jewish people were in uh, in some kind of a trade. You know, had some tailors, you had some shoemakers, you had uh, some guys owned some stores. Uh, one guy owned a flour uh, mill, and uh, a couple of people were uh, doing some uh, buying up apples from orchards from the farmers. Early in the spring, they uh, they used to buy the crop, and hoping that the crop was a good crop. And then after they took off in the fall the apples, they used to resell them to, uh, used to come down big uh, business people who used to make wine or vinegar or that stuff. And they used to buy up the apples and then ship them down to their factories. And we also had a, a Jewish uh, butcher and it so happened that uh, it was a kosher butcher eye, and the guy who owned it was an uncle of mine. That was my father's brother-in-law. And uh, as far as I remember, you know, we had most, I would say, uh, all of the uh, Jewish uh, couples, Jewish people in the town were Orthodox. We had a one shul, and we had also in the same building we had a mikveh, and we had also a cheder, a Hebrew school, public Hebrew school, and uh, we had public schools, Czech schools. I was born in Verki, Portugal, Herpetia. My family was father, mother, and four children, four sons. I had an elder brother and three and two little sisters besides me. My mother wanted real Jewish. So we are sent to a Jewish a Jewish school? school. Not school, it wasn't really a school. Day school. Day school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, day school. Is this a cheder? Yeah, but that wasn't uh, it wasn't for sure a hater. It was the girls. The girls went together and they made us a day school. There was they brought a, a, a teacher. Besides, we had. A beautiful, gorgeous synagogue. We had uh, three, three or four, four synagogues in the town. Town. Can you find the Yes. He was a host of Vishnitz. And the rest of them, there were all kinds of Hasidim in the town. Hundreds? Uh, they counted about 600 people. In Sege, the Jewish people before the war was very good. They lived good. Everybody worked, on, let's see, they began to work Monday morning and they finished Friday afternoon. Everybody went to the mikveh, they cleaned up and they went to the synagogue. 
and everybody from the synagogue to go home, every Jew had everything on the table, like challah, wine, fish, and a nice soup, a nice meal, everybody, all the Jews. Saturday morning, we get up and we went to the synagogue, mostly all, all the Jews. The F, uh, for a three, four hours, we came home, we, we find on the, on the tables everything, uh, Shabbos meals, and then in the afternoon, uh, the people uh, lay down a little, and then in the night time, again to the synagogue. And so, so far it was very good. Everybody lived good. One had a little more, one a little less, but uh, they lived good. It was five big synagogues. I'm born in a village which is called Luch. That was a small village around 30 Jewish family. I lived next to Michael Kratz. And we, I was born there and grew up till I was 21 years old. This is next village to us was Veliki Bochko, Slatina, and the other side from the, there was a Tisa, <coughs> and the other side was Romania, which we were swimming the Tisa across it always, not a disturbance we had there. This was our life till 19, I was still in 1940. We lived there, there's a smaller village. Next to us is a bigger village, it's called Veliki Bochkov. And there we went, I was working in a store. Should I say from the school from the beginning? Yeah. I went to Haider. You want to hear this too? Yeah. Okay. So when we were small boys, we had to go in the Jewish school, which is called the Cheder, and also in the public school. Now, the public school was there half a day only, because half of the children went in the morning, the other half went in the afternoon, just was one public school only. Just we went the f early in the morning, I got up four o'clock in the morning, 4.30 we was already in the Heider. From there, we went to the public school, went home for breakfast, and then went to the public school. And the public school to 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock we went home, and then we went to the Jewish school. There, Heider, late in the evening. And there we grew up. The, the public school, we went together with Michael, you went to the chair. Yeah, that time when I grew up, before was not a chair, it was all just a, a crying school. And then after this came and they opened up a chair school, which I was between the first one. The first, he was in the second year, right? right. Second, and then we went to the chess school, and that we finished, and then we went to work. I was working after, and Veliki Bochkov, that was a store, which I had to work there three years with no pay, just the food, and get, I got it. I was born in 1911 in Hust and grew up there till I've been there till the Second World War started. On the beginning, when I was a youngster, it was just Haders, but later was developed the Talmud Torah. It was a special building for all classes in the Haider. It was a very nice Jewish community. The town was about 20,000 population and 40% of them was Jews. Were there a lot of synagogues there? Synagogues was two big ones, really big ones, and there was Beit Midrashim, Medrish. It was after the name who established it by a certain very famous man in the town, Moshe Rosenfeld, and then was Moshe Ar, Shochetevis. About ten different places was their minions. Do you have any idea how long your family had lived in Khustva? Oh, my family came there. I don't know I came. I didn't set the proper answer. Hundreds of years. 
my brother find this in Prague in 1936 that the first families in that district was the Wolves and the Heinfelds, two families. Was um, there Jewish musicians, Jewish theater, play groups in Proust? No, Jewish theater used to come every winter in the winter time. That was the, their name was the Polish Zingers. And the director was, I, I can't remember, I used to know his name, Franzos, yes. His name was Franzos. He was a Polish man. Very good performances. What are the kinds of work that Jewish people did in Hoost? Oh, there was, no, there was uh, different professions. In every profession you find Jews, but it was a lot of businesses, open businesses, offices. I can say that the business was 95% in Jewish hands. I by myself own on the main street, my store, chemist store. And what kind of things did you, did you sell in your store? It was a chemist store. We sold, apart from the chemistry, sport articles and I have in a big way photo articles. I sold it to the whole era where there was smaller business. I don't buy to order from Prague. Well, you know, it's a small town and they uh, didn't have cars that time, but they used to have beautiful horses. And all those horses, if somebody came to town, like uh, I heard from my father, that Rudolf Hausburg came to town and he had a castle in our town. Michael, you remember? Cousin. Cousin. Yeah. So, grandfather's horses, they used to put on. The great grandfather. The great grandfather. And then the, the grandfather, too, Hamleiser. He was still a. a Alive that time when he used to come to Lonka, and he had a girlfriend from Poland. She was called Vecere Mario. Anyway, that's where they used to meet in that castle, in our little town. So he used to bring them in from the railway station and uh, he used to send his driver a driver yeah With four to pick them up four horses beautiful white horses they used to be and uh, did he have to get permission to have four horses no oh, no he could have four? no oh. he could have as many as he liked mm -hmm. No, that time he could have. What did your great grandfather do on the railroad? On the railroad, yeah. he was uh, uh, just checking, like, uh, what does an engineer do? He was oh. planning. Yeah. You know, checking if everything, Design. planning, yeah. planning, and then after when it, it, they were working on it, he was checking that. Uh -huh. Do you know where he came from in Russia? What part? What part? No. 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 Don't. Don't remember what part. And uh, that's about all what I heard. My father used to love to tell us all those stories. Friday night, that's when we had a big supper. Everybody had to sit around the table. Nobody could go out on Friday night, nowhere. And we had to, to sit there and listen to his stories. That was Friday night. 
Saturday night he had a, a another thing which he liked to play the violin. violin. <laughs> so give us a concert. Yeah, gave, gave us a concert. <laughs> as you say. Yeah. yeah. And he couldn't read notes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, he could could play very well. And they used to say he used to learn from the gypsies. The gypsies were good violinists. And he used to learn that from them. He liked that. And Sunday used to play cards. And what? Sunday night he used to play cards. Yeah, Sunday night play cards. That's right. You see? You remember, that's right. They used to play cards with their only a brother and, and two brother in laws. Only the family. So they used to they used to play cards for money or just for fun? Of course for money. Money. Yeah, money. They used to smoke cigarettes, you could cut the, the smoke in the room. How heavy, that's how heavy it was. <laughs> They drink uh, vodka or something? No, no, no. Maybe a beer. They used to have a beer. And they used to play Sunday afternoon kugel. What do you call that? Uh, bowling. 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 Bowling? Yeah. Bowling. They used to play. Do they have a bowling alley? Alley, yeah. yeah. In Lou? So in Lou. They had a bowling alley. Yeah. They used to play. It was Sunday afternoon. But On Saturday nights when he played the violin, yeah. did the whole family sing together of too? Of course, yeah. whole family sang together. Sometimes when we were very little, we used to dance around the table, <laughs> the dance. That, uh, and then when we grew up a little bit older, when I was maybe 13, 14 years old, we loved to read novels. That when we started to get books from libraries and read novels. So, well, sometimes my mother uh, wanted me to help her out in the kitchen. So come on and help out. Don't just sit and read. I'd, then I used to go in the bathroom, lock myself in the bathroom every day. <laughs> the, the Jewish community of Hus, there was approximately 5,000 6, Jews. We lived together in peaceful with all the people there. We have no problem. We make a good living. It was poor, the, 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 near, the area was poor, with not very rich, but everybody mind his business and the checks protect us, we really cannot say nothing, nothing against the Czech people. Were there a lot of Jewish stores? And well, there was a lot of Jewish stores, there was a lot of factories there, Jewish factories there, there was a lot of Jewish, uh, as I said before, synagogues and organizations. And we, we, have, we, we didn't bother, no, we, we, we respect the law, and this is why the Czech likes us. I was born <coughs> in Lou in the Carpathian Mountains in uh, 1925, 2nd of January. And before the war, we were, uh, as children, grew up in a small town, uh, going to a Jewish cheder, and also to the Czech school. And we had uh, quite an active uh, Jewish life with the synagogue and uh, a Jewish organization, which was uh, uh, which my father helped to support the uh, uh, Jewish people that they, that they could not afford the uh, Jewish education. And uh, then, uh, till 1939, I was in school, uh, finishing in the middle of uh, high school. We had two stores, and it was, uh, you know, 
very well off in those times. We had uh, two girls working. One was the whole time with us. And then one was just coming in for big cleaning or something. And uh, that's it. My mother was cooking, but the girl was everything doing. Uh, uh, potato peeling and all the things she never did. And we never went in, in the kitchen. If I went in, in the kitchen to help, my mother said, you have time, go out. So we was just playing outside, or we went in the store a little to help out if they need it. And uh, we really didn't work in the house. We had a pretty good life. They used to say this was in the time when they checked that this, this is small America, like America. Well, it was very good to the Jews in those days. And Siget, most of the people were religious, orthodox. Uh, I grew up in a very, very warm, nice, well-known family. Uh, I was the only child. My parents lived with their parents. So I grew up in my grandparents' house. I went to shul every Saturday with my grandfather. As a matter of fact, I used to carry his talis because you were not allowed to wear, to carry things. This is called the uh, Erev. There was no Erev. Michael, is it Erev? Religious. The religious... Um, Jews believe not to carry. It has to be, the city has to be surrounded with a certain... Um, Sign wire. Wire to be allowed to carry things. I was a little girl. I used to carry for my grandfather the talis to shul. I used to sit there, play around, watch everybody, and then when we came home, I carried his talis back home. Um, I went to Hebrew school three times a week. There was a school called um, Beis Yaakov. Three times a week I went to Hebrew school. I had a very nice teacher that I liked very much. I even remember her name. Her name was Chaya Haas. She taught even my aunt, Goldie, used to be her student for years. And um, there was organizations, Zionist organizations, that teenagers used to get together Friday night for singing and dancing. I didn't belong to any because I was too young, but my Aunt Goldie used to take me. If I behaved all week long, she would take me Friday night to this sing-along. She belonged to the Mizrahi organization. There was Agudat Israel, there was Mizrahi organization, and there was uh, Shomer Hatzair. And, uh, but most of the people were really religious people. There were all the holidays was, were observed, stores were closed. Every Friday night afternoon, you could see how everybody was running home. They closed the stores. Saturdays was peace and quiet because most of the stores belonged to Jewish people. And if they closed the stores, the streets were quiet. But then the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people respected them and they abide by it. So they did their stop shopping before Saturday. As a kid, I used to go not by myself, either with my mother or with my aunt, Goldie, or the other two aunts I had that didn't survive the war. I used to go with them to the, to the shoichet, and uh, there was a lady who used to uh, clean the chickens for us on the spot. Every Friday afternoon, my grandfather used to send me to buy wine for Shabbos, for Kiddush. As a matter of fact, his name was so well known that he used to send me to the store without money. And he said, you just tell whose granddaughter you are. Your credit is good. And that's what happened. I used to go for wine, and I said, my grandfather sent me. My father was a, a scholar. He, he, he was not a businessman. He made hardly a living, but he was a highly intellectual. He read to us, 
used to read stories to me and tell us story. He was a very good storyteller, but he did not survive. Did your father teach Jewish children? Yes, my father was. My father was a fluent in Hebrew, and he taught children for the bar mitzvah. And he studied with a study group every Saturday afternoon in the synagogue with older men who were anxious to study Torah. My father used to study with them on, in the synagogue. As a matter of fact, one day I came into a small neighborhood grocery store and the owner of the store said to another customer, to an adult man, you know who this little girl is? This is the daughter of the man who teaches us on Saturday in shul, who studies with us on Saturday in the shul, and I was very proud of that. And it was a terrible loss. For me, when I lost my father, he was a very great man. Did you like to play sports or? No, like no. <laughs> my only <laughs> sport was running with the neighborhood children. I was really a tomboy. I used to go over the <laughs> climbing trees <laughs> and uh, playing. I, my mother didn't let me because she was overprotective. She wouldn't let me swim. She didn't let me skate because she was always afraid something would get hurt. I didn't participate. I didn't participate in any sports. Did they have electricity running? Yes. No. No, no, no. They had, we had electricity, but there was no running water and there was no Toilets in the house, only out, 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 House. houses, and there was a a um, um, abrino, the water, oh, well. a well, a well, water well. That's where we got our water, cold and fresh and clean. Uh, my grandfather had. A, a big household. His his profession was a um, transport transportation, transportation, but not with uh, cars or trucks, but horses and cars, uh, wagons. They, they were a company, six partners. So it was a big household with horses and cows and and chickens and and. Um, even a tick, a tick, oh. um, not sheep, the other one, what's a tick? <laughs> sheep, a sheep. No sheep. A lamb? No, the, you know the, the ones? The goat. Goats, yeah, goats. Did, did you make goat's milk and goat's cheese? No, they made me drink goat milk. <laughs> they didn't make the cheese. We used to make sometimes butter. There was a lot of milk. So my grandmother used to make their own butter. And there was a lot of eggs and a lot of vegetables, a big garden uh, by the house. And there was a big garden with uh, 41 prune trees. And I climbed all of them. A lot of mountains, beautiful rivers, nice two big rivers. One was the Tisa that divided us from your grandparents, from Le, and the other one was the Isa, a nice river where people went in the summer to swim and fishing. Anybody own an automobile? No, there, there was only one automobile that was a prof, a prof, a, 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 like a um, commercial. A guy had a taxi that took people if they had to go in emergency out of town. And uh, in town, there were only horse and carriage. If somebody had to come in from the train in town, or if somebody was sick going to the doctor, we took a carriage, horse and carriage. There was no buses in town, only for out town, like out 
the city, from city to city, but mostly they were using uh, horse and carriages. Were there famous rabbis in Yes, Sigat? yes. Tell me about they some had, of the famous rabbis. There was a very famous Sigit Aruf. He was the chief rabbi for Sigit, very well known. And then there was a Kretchen of a Rebbe, who was also very well known. Uh, they had big families and uh, very well known. And then, of course, the famous Nobel Prize winner, Eli Wiesel, is also from Siget. And I happen to know his parents. They lived not far from my grandparents. And his father owned a little grocery store, and we used to shop there, too. Did you go to summer camps? No, I didn't. I didn't go. There were summer camps. Some families who had a lot of kids, usually, Every household was five, six, or eight, and ten children. <laughs> Since I was the only one, my mother didn't allow me to go. But many children went to camps. There were summer camps run by the Jewish community for children to give them a chance. Uh, I come from Rachov. It's a small city. At one time, it was a town, and it grew to a city. And I come from the Carpathian Mountains, which are the ends of the Alps and the beginning of the Tatras. We actually live in the mountains. All the Jews and my parents and myself, we lived in the valley. We were seven in the family, five children and my parents, three boys and two girls. I was the youngest. I was born to my parents late in life. We all lived a very happy life, very together, very loved. And my fa father was a businessman. He dealt with cattle. We had a store which was like a general food store. And by the time the turnover came in 1939, I had a married sister who had two children. And I also had a married brother. When I was born, I already had a 20-year-old brother. It means I was born so late in life. We have a nice synagogue over there. And my home. We have three synagogues over there. And it was a nice community. And uh, we was in the meat business. And I was working with my father. And my father was a, a young fellow when he, they took him away. He was maybe 58 years. My mother was about 38 years when they, when they took her to, to Auschwitz. I was born in the de Sous. We were a family of 10. Uh, <laughs> it was a very nice town. We were living with, with our grandfather. We had synagogues. We had Jewish school. We had, I went to Romanian school till when the Hungarian came in. When the Hungarian people came in, they didn't let Jewish kids to go to school. Well, to describe the school, it was an uh, Orthodox school. The Bema were uh, the cantor or the, or the rabbi was praying, was right in the middle of the room. And the seats were all around the walls. And uh, we used to have services there twice a day during the week. And then we had uh, Friday night services and Saturday services. And uh, usually we used to have a little, uh, like a kiddish, which is like a cocktail party after the services. The mikveh, which they had, is like an indoor pool. And the Orthodox Jewish people believe that if they take uh, a bath there on Friday, they are clean 
to pray for uh, Saturday. And uh, also, you know, it, it was used uh, sometimes for women and sometimes for men, never together. It was uh, run by the guy who ran, who was the guard or the manager, whatever you call it, on the shul. He used to make sure that uh, the water is clean and uh, he supplied you with the soap and a towel and you had to pay a fee for that. And every Friday afternoon my father used to take us, me and my brother, to this uh, pool. Uh, the shore was mostly, uh, uh, most buildings in the town uh, were made out of wood. We had a lot of forest. I come from a part of the country, Carpathia, where it was mostly 90% uh, forest and we had plenty of wood and it was cheaper to build houses with wood than with brick or whatever. And uh, so the shul was a uh, wooden building, wooden uh, roof, and there was no uh, toilets like, uh, you know, we have today, flushing toilet. It was outhouses. So we had an outhouse for women, outhouse for men in the sh uh, around the shul. And uh, the guy who took care of the shul usually uh, made sure that we had some flowers around the shul and some uh, shrubbery and, uh, to make it a little uh, nice and clean looking and appetizing so people you know, will come. We did not have a hospital in town, so we had midwives who uh, used to come over to the house and help deliver the baby. So I would say most, of, most babies were born in the house. You know, they didn't have any nurses or uh, that stuff. It was uh, kind of, you know, primitive. The midwife was making sure that everything is clean and uh, she was, uh, you know, she practiced that stuff and she uh, knew what she was doing. It was just like uh, having a baby in the hospital. We were uh, like a close family, the whole community. And uh, if there was anything to be uh, helped, everybody, uh, you know, chipped in to help. We were very uh, family oriented. We uh, got together every Saturday after the, you know, we went to the temple. And after we had dinner, we used to go out for a walk down near the river. And we used to uh, meet cousins from other towns, from nearby towns, they used to come down to the river too. That was uh, almost, I would say, every Saturday afternoon. And this was like a ritual to find all the, uh, you know, the, to see all the relatives and uh, talk over things, you know, f from the week, what happened, and who is, uh, you know, sick, or who is uh, getting married, or whatever. There was a dam about 60 miles north of Lou, and every week, twice a week, Wednesday and Saturday, they used to open up the dam, and they used to bring down the logs from the forest, cleaned up, and they used to be men, they used to tie together the logs, and they used to be men piloting like 
the locks down the river, which was going into Hungary. Hungary was very poor in forests. They didn't have any forests. So they used to buy all kinds of uh, lumber and logs from uh, our area. And that's how they used to get them down. It's, uh, that was the transportation was on the river. Certain places were dangerous to swim if you didn't, if you were not too uh, good of a swimmer. But certain places you could go in and just uh, cool off in the summertime. And uh, the women used to go down to the river and do their laundry, but not where it was uh, swimming. They used to go away from the places, you know, where it was more rocky, so they can uh, do their laundry. They used to like beat the laundry and the rocks so to, to make it clean. Well, the Jewish weddings, uh, as I remember, is they used to have big feasts, really uh, weddings. They didn't uh, send out invitations, but the whole community was invited. There was no such thing as leaving out anybody. And uh, I don't, I think a day before, the, the groom could not uh, see the bride. I mean, that was the custom. And the bride, when she came to the wedding, uh, to the place where the wedding was, she came with her friends and uh, she used to be in a room and before the wedding, before the ceremony, there was a guy who used to sing all kinds of poems. And like when he went along singing, he made up the words. And sometimes it used to be very sad you know, words for the bride, you know, that she's leaving the mother and father and she's starting a new life. And uh, uh, it was sad and the, the women used to cry. And then the groom used to walk in with, the, with his friends and they used to make sure, I mean, that was the tradition uh, or the custom, to make sure that he's getting the girl he wants to marry. So he came to check if that's the girl. And that's how he, you know, uh, uh, you know married her. After he looked and uh, it was the girl he wanted to marry, then they went into the room where the ceremony was. And after the ceremony, they had uh, a band who used to be a very uh, loud, uh, you know, Jewish songs and all kinds of uh, very uh, good for dancing and jumping around, you know. And uh, they used to have a lot of food and usually weddings used to last for two, three days. You know, they had, everybody had a good time. And they used to have a few drinks. And uh, after you have a few drinks, you, you even enjoy more. You know, you dance a lot and you jump around. And it was uh, very uh, freilich. Well, during the year, you know, we had uh, you know, the traditional holidays, and religious holidays. One of them was Hanukkah and Purim, and uh, which was traditional holidays, and everybody was uh, exchanging gifts. 
the women used to bake for weeks and send out all kinds of uh, cakes and cookies and whatever. And also certain gifts like uh, dresses or aprons or uh, men's sweaters or uh, women's sweaters. They used to exchange gifts. And for the poor people, my father used to put in money too. And uh, that was Purim and Hanukkah. On the high holidays, I used to be uh, very religious. We used to have a cantor, hire a cantor to come to our town and perform the religious prayers. It was very moving. And some religious holidays we used to go, my father used to be a choset, uh, follow this rabbi from Vizhnitz, which was always on tour on the high holidays. He used to be sometimes near us, not too far from us. So we used to go for the high holidays to the place where he was. And uh, I remember one high holiday, I was about 12 years old. I was so moved with the canter and the choir they had that I didn't eat the whole day. I fasted. That was on Yom Kippur. And I think that was the first time I fasted all day, and the last time. I don't think I fasted after that the whole day. I used to enjoy a cantorial service and the choir. So uh, I was looking forward for these uh, holidays. And usually, uh, at these holidays, we used to get new clothes, you know, and uh, we looked forward to it. You know, a new suit, a new pair of shoes, uh, shirts and neckties, and we used to dress up, and it was really fun. Well, at the Munich Agreement in September of 1938, Germany received the Sudetenland at the same time, Hungary had also been making demands on the Czechoslovakian Republic for the return of lands that they had once occupied in the days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the Munich Pact also decided that Hungary's demands would be met within three months after the meeting. So in November of 1938, in Vienna, the Vienna Award was given out, and Hungary received a parts of Carpathia, as well as parts of Eastern Slovakia. Now, the political climate in Carpathia then was that they had their own government. It was made up of the Carpathian Ukraine people, and the strong arm of that government was the sieges, or siege guard, and they were very anti-Semitic. Now, things went like that from September 38 till March 15th, 1939. And on March 15th, 1939, the Hungarians invaded and they took over the little amount of Carpathia that was left. 